As they say in Mighty Python, and now for something completely different from what we've done before. We started today considering the world stage. This afternoon, we are bringing it home for each and every one of us to North Carolina, bringing the conversation to our own personal roles in the future of food. From the beginning of this summit, we had a number of key, a, a, a number of key goals. The first goal was to convene, which is to bring together stakeholders from across government and academia, across all agricultural, biotechnology, and allied industries around shared interest and shared purpose to foster the networking and synergy that we all know that we need to have to move ahead. The second goal was to inform, and that's to bring us up to date on the issues and information that affects your livelihood and the future of our state and the society at large. Third, and maybe the most important, is to engage, to allow us the opportunity to listen to you, to learn what is important to you, and to work together to create strategies that will advance agriculture and biotechnology, drive economic development, help to enhance our agriculture production, in distribution not only in North Carolina, but around our nation and world, and lastly, to contribute to a future in which food security is a reality for all humankind. In this session, we hone in on the final goal, which is engagement. In this working session, led by 35 highly trained facilitators and leadership development professionals, we will come together to identify barriers and opportunities for us to advance food security and economic opportunity, to develop actionable goals to overcome barriers and seize opportunities, and to make a shared commitment to achieve those goals together. We also have a goal to stimulate the conversation. We'll briefly hear from four North Carolina thought leaders. We'll have them share their thoughts about what we can do at the local level that will impact us nationally and globally related to advances in food production, security, and sustainability. I'm very proud to, in, to, to introduce the four speakers that we'll have this afternoon. The first speaker will be the Honorable Brent Jackson. Of course, he's our North Carolina State Senator and co-founder of Jackson Farming. Our next speaker, will be Beth Foster, who's a farmer, but I'll introduce her not just as a farmer, but as an energetic farmer. And you'll see that when she comes to the podium. She's also secretary and treasurer of the Blackland Farm Managers Association. Our third speaker will be Richard McKellogg, the director of produce and flora merchandising at Lowe's Food. And last is Larry Wooten, our president of the North Carolina Farm Bureau Federation. They will each have about five to seven minutes to be able to provide remarks about the future of agriculture, particular to the state of North Carolina. Let's welcome all four of them. Good afternoon. Ah, that's mighty weak. Good afternoon. All right, I want y'all to be wide awake and aware. There's a couple of forewarnings I want to give you before I get started in my speech. After I speak, I'm leaving. So don't take that against you. I'll have another meeting. I have to be back at the General Assembly. The other thing I want to tell you about is you're looking at a dinosaur. Me. You're looking at a dinosaur, and I'll tell you why. I'm a first-generation farmer. First-generation farmer, and there's not many of us around. But we've been trying to encourage more to do so, and I'm sure you'll be hearing more from Dean Linton and Dr. Purdue and some of them in the coming of our apprenticeship program, and I want to put a plug in for that, Dean Linton, at this point in time. So keep your ears and eyes open. We need more young people in agriculture, and I think you all understand that. I am Brent Jackson. I'm a farmer. I just happen to be a North Carolina senator as well. But never mistake the two. I am a farmer. I've told them, we were joking here back at the farm, and with some of my staff, they says, well, when you die, what do you want on your tombstone? I says, he was just a farmer. 
and I am. I'm from Sampson County, born and raised there all my life. I actually live on the property. I was born, well, I wasn't born there. I was born in the hospital. But when my mom and dad brought me home, that's where I'm at today. And the joke with my wife is, you know, because she was a child, our childhood sweetheart, we were. And the joke is, you know, if we were to happen to get a divorce, she or I, one, would be living in a camper on the back of the property because I'm not moving <laughs> on there. But I want to thank Dean Linton and the group here today for having me at the North Carolina Biotech Center and the NC State University College of Agriculture and Life Sciences for hosting this event. It's an important event. How many of you in here have ever read In Balance with Nature? I'm amazed. None of you in here have ever read in balance with nature? Well, I want to encourage you. Google it. Look it up and read it. It was written in the 70s by a former horticultural specialist out of Michigan State. Read it. You'll get a kick out of it. I believe this group will. As you know, agriculture is North Carolina's largest industry, $77 billion. It's our number one industry. And for us in rural North Carolina, it is the lifeblood of our communities. Events like this and the tireless, tireless efforts of groups like the North Carolina Biotech and NC State are what keep our industry moving forward, finding next generational technology that produces better yields, uncovering the latest scientific discoveries that make us a healthier population, and continuing to support the hard work of farmers, not only in North Carolina, but across the globe. You know, we talk about sustainability. And my oldest son, who runs the operation, as he calls it while I'm up in Raleigh playing, playing, seeing it, he says, you know, everybody talks about sustainability. And they do. But he says, do you know what the number one thing is for us farmers in sustainability? And I stood there a minute, and we said, and this just happened over the weekend. I said, what is it, son? He says, we have to make a profit. And he's right. In order for us to be sustainable, a farmer has to make a profit. For any business to be sustainable, they have to make a profit. And as I said, as a farmer first and a state senator second, I'm here today to share just a few of my thoughts in how we're supporting organizations like our host today to advance food production, security, and sustainability. North Carolina is in a wonderful position moving into the future, and I've had the privilege of meeting with rural and agricultural leaders from across the country, and I can tell you that the relationship that the North Carolina General Assembly, the North Carolina State, and the Department of Agriculture share is a very unusual relationship across this country, and even in the Southeast. I happen to serve on the board of directors of the uh, Southern Agricultural Rural Leaders, which is a global, uh, it's mostly made up of United States and Canada representation. But nowhere in that group do we have the relationship that we have here in North Carolina, and we need to build upon that. And when you, when you add in the fact that the RTP is filled with biotechnology companies already doing amazing work in this field, I'm extremely confident. I am. I'm excited. I mean, we should all be excited that the future of North Carolina as an agricultural leader is not just going to be a myth, but it's going to be a fact. It is a fact today. As you've heard numerous times yesterday from what I've been told of how we've got to feed 9 billion people by 2050. But we've got farms that are no longer neighbors to farms, but they're farms to subdivisions. We've got farmers that are neighbors to what I call urbanites. We've got folks that don't quite understand. Tell you a quick little story. Uh, our office, which uh, was my grandparents' home, so it's a lot going to grandma's every day. That worked for about the first year, and then we actually realized we had to do some work in there, so it didn't feel like grandma's house anymore. But it had got out of the family one time, and a outsider had bought it. They had lived in that house about three months, and we farm all around it. After about three months there in the spring, we got a letter stating 
that we were raising too much dust, that they wanted us to cease and desist tilling the soil because it was disturbing their way of life. That's a true story that happened 15 years ago. And it's not got any better in some areas, folks. One of the goals that must be a priority for me as a member of the General Assembly and the legislature, and as you as industry leaders, is that we continue to take advantage of the special relationships we have here in North Carolina. Farmers have to be able to farm, and lawmakers have to learn how to stay out of the way. And biotechnology corporations are going to have to continue gaining ground. And all are going to need to have the resources and public support to fulfill these tasks. We've had a good run at the North Carolina General Assembly over the past four years, putting agriculture back in the forefront of legislators' minds. Our joint and agricultural rural caucus that meets twice a month continues to build in attendance and has become a wonderful avenue for discussion. You know, I was amazed when I got to the General Assembly four years ago. We had caucuses for everything you could possibly think of except for agriculture. And so Representative J.H. Langdon and myself got together and we decided we needed an ag and rural caucus and we formed one. And currently we have 40 plus members and it is gaining. And we use that time to educate our non-rural folks and our non-farm folks the importance of ag and the bills that we are running through the General Assembly, how they will affect the average people. And it's been very beneficial. Over the past two years, we have passed numerous bills that have directly benefited the agriculture industry with the goal of bringing our state in line with the technological advancements in the industry. As we move into future legislation sessions, it is important that we continue to put our farmers in the best position possible for success. One example of governing gone wrong is the political fight that has overtaken over GMOs, especially within the European Union. I understand there was a lively debate on that yesterday. And I want to reiterate the point that it shows how a breakdown in the relationship between government, agriculture, and science can lead to disastrous results. One example, though, of governing done right has been the understanding by my colleagues that our tax system needed some changes. That being said, it isn't a perfect process, and there are still some changes needed to protect our farmers and agriculture industry. As you all know very well, farmers produce a finished product that requires many different inputs, such as fertilizer, herbicides, pesticides, fuel, so forth and so on. As Bostone, I understand, quoted yesterday, borrowing from uh, President John F. Kennedy, farming is the only business where you buy at retail, sell at wholesale, and pay the freight both ways. And folks, that is the truth. And you're talking about trying to educate 170 members, 169, because I understand it, 169 members of the General Assembly on that statement alone is a monumental task. But we're getting there. We are getting there. I have always argued that it is wrong to tax every material that goes into a product and then tax the final product again when it is sold to the consumer. Furthermore, the financial reality for many farmers is such that should they lose their exemptions, they would be unable to purchase the materials they need to continue putting food on our tables. If agriculture is going to continue to grow in North Carolina, we need a consistent tax system that recognizes and takes into account the realities of what it takes to produce food. In other words, we need to make it sustainable. Another area where government can play a positive role, if done correctly, is in with product shipping. If we want to expand the industry and bring North Carolina products to new markets, we must find economically viable ways to move our products to those markets. In other words, we have to have infrastructure, folks, whether it be roads, rail, or natural gas. And we're working on those things at the General Assembly, as well as research and development, which holds the promise of discovering more efficient methods of transportation and extending shelf life, as we've seen earlier this morning. Any good businessman will tell you that producing a product is only half the battle. If you can't bring your product to market and sell it, you won't be in business for very long. An exciting opportunity I see for investment in North Carolina is in the food processing business. You know, it has been said 85% of our products in North Carolina are shipped out of state to be processed. 85%. While so many products grown here and so few processing plants, there is ample room for expansion and added value. 
For example, as many of you in this room might remember or know, a sweet potato, sweet potato processing plant recently began operation in Robinson County. Before that plant opened, North Carolina sweet potatoes were shipped to Canada to be processed and then shipped back into the United States to be redistributed. That's ludicrous. We need processing plants in this state. And that's where we're going to get rural growth, is by putting in the money and the resources in these types of events. Having a processing plant right here would allow our state for our money to stay here, create jobs, and fuel the economy. I believe that food processing holds endless opportunities in North Carolina. You know, it was said yesterday, I think, by Dr. Sonny, and I'm going to just call him Dr. Sonny, biotech doesn't feed the world's farmers do, and that's accurate. But I would like to take that a step further. If farmers are the soul of agriculture, biotechnology is the industry's heartbeat. Without growing technology and spreading these advancements, we will have a food emergency on our hands that will fester for many years and affect the world's growing population for decades. As farmers, we are tasked with putting food on the tables for families around the world, and I take the responsibility very seriously. I want to think about the one stat that you've heard over and over again these past two days. Nine billion mouths to feed by 2050. All the food that we grow now and doubling that on less land and with greater restrictions than ever before is a necessity and the only way we will rise to the challenge is to continue building these special relationships. Farmers, lawmakers, and biotechnology are going to have to become even more aligned for this to be possible. I got to stop and tell you just a quick little story. Senator Ellie Kinnear, dear sweet friend of mine from Carborough, she's no longer in the General Assembly, she was getting on me two years ago when she found out we sold the Whole Foods. She said, Brent, says you use herbicides and pesticides and fungicides. I said, yes, ma'am, we do. She says, well, you need to do it like my community does, where we all get together and we grow our own. And I said, Senator Crenaird, I said, sweetheart, I said, that's wonderful. I said, I do. I says, I think that is just wonderful that y'all get together and you grow for your own little neighborhood. And I think that is wonderful. It's a niche market. Everybody needs a niche market. I says, but Senator Kernaird, I says, I'm not just growing for my neighborhood. I says, I'm trying to feed approximately 200 people off of what I do. I says, you can't do that with what you're doing. I says, I've got to feed a hungry world. I says, and your niche markets has their place, and they do. I am a strong proponent of agriculture in any sense of the word, but we have to put reality into it as well. And we can't do it without biotechnology. We can't do it without GMOs. And we don't want a hungry people, as I heard Commissioner Troxler tell you this morning, that a hungry people is an angry people. But I believe that North Carolina has the potential to play a pivotal role in increasing production by capitalizing on the resources we have available here. The biotechnology and life science industry are thriving in this state, and it will be innovations from companies, and it will be by innovations from companies in those sectors that will allow us to increase and bring enough food to market to feed a hungry and growing world. We're in a unique position to lead the charge into the next generation of food production, and I believe we can do just that. And folks, I'm here to tell you, I'm all in all with this endeavor. When I had my staff help me write this speech, uh, Towers, who was here, Towers, where you at? He's about there at the back. Towers said, oh, this be easy. He said, you bought into this a long time ago. So, and he was right. I had bought into this biotechnology a long time ago. Because I can remember when we produced corn in Sampson County in the 70s and 80s, and if we had drought, we made 20, 30 bushels to the acre. I've seen it go from that to when we have drought, and it goes to 80 to 120 bushels an acre. Big difference and it's because of biotechnology and because of what has been done in the industry. So yes, I bought into that program a long time ago. And we, I will continue to support entities like the North Carolina Biotechnology Center and North Carolina State University College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. I wanna thank you again for having me here today to speak with you. I hope I've given you something to think about. The future of agriculture in this state will be determined by people like you who have the passion, drive to find solutions to our toughest problems and capitalize on the resources and opportunities that abound here in North Carolina. I want to encourage you and give you a homework assignment to add to the one that we got at lunch. 
look up in balance with nature and read it. You might agree with it or disagree with it, but you'll be amazed at how it resembles today's society. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience. And may God continue to bless our endeavors in feeding a hungry world. Thank you all. Beth Foster, and um, I am the another farmer on the panel. Um, I actually was in my office this morning and um, left home and hightailed it here to speak. I'm headed back home to continue wrapping up soybeans and my cotton crops. So. Um, uh, I am a farmer. I tell everybody, don't um, don't judge a book by its cover. So uh, I may not be the, the typical looking farmer, but um, I came from farming and married into farming. And um, my husband is actually here today. He's from the western part of North Carolina, but he um, lives with me, obviously, in the eastern part now. Um, so, but we, we also farm in the eastern and western parts of North Carolina. And my husband's also a grain buyer all over the state. So... Um, Anyway, um, there are many things that we um, as humans can um, live without, um, but there are certain things that are essential to live, and that is eating, uh, drinking, and breathing. So uh, no matter what business you're in or what job that you have, we're always thinking about ways to do it more efficiently and effectively. And whatever we do, we always want to do it better. Um, change is a constant. It's inevitable. It's always going to be there. There's always going to be a problem to be solved um, and a challenge to overcome. So um, agriculture is a vast industry that affects um, just about every part of life, whether you're directly or indirectly involved in it. Um, there are several things that I was, um, I've been thinking about how to sustain um, agriculture for the now and for the future. Um, some of those things that I have um, that have come to mind to me are uh, renewable fuels. We are very um, uh, dependent on petroleum products. That's always something to certain, you know, to be looking ahead um, and looking at. Um, increasing um, crop yields. Um, I'm always looking to increase my production and my profits on my farm. That's always, you know, how can we make more? Um, to strengthen crops, um, and the research is needed to um, reduce um, pest and disease damage um, so that I can get more per acre for my crop. Um, I'll give you an example. We had an early hurricane this year right around the week of July 4th, and it was amazing to go around to the different areas and see um, how the corn varieties that stood up to the wind and what they did and how they reacted to it at the you know, stage at where it was at when that hurricane hit. It's, it's just, um, it was very interesting. So um, that research um, is always there to help us, like I say, improve what we do. Um, as a farmer, um, I, you know, I'm always wanting to preserve and improve our soils. Um, and make a profit because it is like Senator Jackson just said, it's about making a profit where, you know, we, we, um, to be viable and to, and, and to sustain ourselves, we, we, um, somebody once told me if I'm going to be a broke man, I'm going to be a well, re well rested broke man. You know, you, you don't want to work, uh, work yourself right in a hole. And in agriculture as a farmer, we work, um, a lot of we we work 80 plus hours a week sometimes a, a lot of the year um it's it's demanding it's a lifestyle we live it we breathe it um we're with it all the time we never um we never walk away from it it's not like we can just um shut the door and walk away um it's it's a part of us it's uh, something i say is in your blood um and but we enjoy it you know no matter how good or bad it gets sometimes we still um go back at it and get up and and work hard at it and it's it's, it's just uh, um it's very at the end of the year like we are now wrapping up our crops and seeing what we've worked all year to accomplish it's very humbling um Again, we, um, no year is ever the same. There's a lot of factors that um, help me to run my business, whether it's weather, 
um, rainfall amounts, hurricanes, soil types, my variety and my seed selections, um, choosing my rotations due to disease or weed control, um, supply and demand, we look at that both uh, locally and globally. Um, the input cost, um, the cost of fuel, uh, chemicals, fertilizers, labor needs, we look at those all the time in government regulations. Um, we have been given this beautiful earth. It's just like I was, we were riding here, my husband and I, this morning, and, and you just look at um, the colors of the trees and the sky. It's, just, it's, it's purely amazing to me. And um, we have been given this, and we certainly um, need to be conscious of our actions um, and how we uh, think ahead and, and do take care of, of this earth. However, we have, you know, we've been given resources, and we need to use them wisely, but use them um, more in a competitive way um, to keep on that cutting edge of the markets. Um, you know, we, we, we use them wisely, but use them for a profitable way to um, improve our lives as humans. Um, we want to be, you know, more profitable, waste less, use what we have um, in, in a, in a um, very efficient way without bogging down any industry with regulations or costs that um, don't make you viable and competitive and profitable. So we have to be very careful with that. Um, we also, um, you know, nothing comes free. Everything comes at a cost. Um, so there, you know, there are disadvantages and advantages to everything. There's pros and there's cons. Um, we have to weigh all those factors when we're making decisions in anything we do, no matter what, what industry you're in. Um, we want to do what's right for the general good of all, all people in the, in the future. Um, so that's why we need biotechnology. We need biotechnology to find out um, uh, solutions to problems, um, to improve our agricultural industry, because again, that's what it's all about. We're always um, solving a problem or overcoming a challenge, and um, that, that certainly is a given. So um, I'm obviously not a researcher, but um, it takes um, many people in the agricultural industry to get those products out to, a, um, to our world. And um, what research is done through biotechnology, I take in, in my business and use it to apply it off over a larger amount of acres. Um, and we do, again, like Senator Jackson, we take what we do as farmers very seriously. Um, This, again, the applied uh, research is um, very applicable to me because um, the, the more efficient, more effective, the more it creates and more it puts on my bottom line. And it more, it, um, it does, I have three children, so um, I always tell everybody I have a, a, certainly an interest, a vested interest in many things to make the next, you know, things easier for the next generation and um, for my children and their benefit and their future. And that's the way I feel with my farming, um, with a lot of the biotech research that's come out to improve the lives of the next generation. That's what we're here for as stewards for each other. Um, also, I was um, thinking about, it's, you know, I, I, my fourth bullet point here was keeping a safe, abundant, and available food supply. And that's really the goal. You know, um, as, as Commissioner Troxler does say, that's his, my favorite saying, he, he says is, you know, a hungry world is a mean world. And we can do without a lot of things, but um, eating is not one of them. And we do, um, we want to keep it safe abundant, you know, and readily available, getting it, that infrastructure to get it where it needs to go, to reaching the people. Um, you know, we, we um, you know, food and fiber, it's, it's, it's not just a, it's a homeland security issue, if you ask me. I feel like because, you know, we, we all have to eat and, and, and being hungry is certainly a, um, can be a serious problem. We want to keep that, that, um, readily available to America and keep that that upper hand with um, never uh, I always said just the food and fiber needs to be grown here in America um, we we um, to to keep ourselves um, sustained um, but anyway it's it's been a pleasure being here 
And um, I hope that um, y'all have enjoyed. I wish I could have been here with more, but like I said, we have been very busy wrapping up our year. We've had a, a pretty good year farming, so no complaints. Um, but I was, I was certainly glad my husband could come with me today to, um, to, to be with me because we don't get a lot of time together lately. So, um, but again, I, I've, I've enjoyed being here the short time that I have and um, I'm certainly a supporter of biotechnology. I'll use it every day on my farm and um, North Carolina needs to keep up the good work with the biotechnology and keep to keep that research going because that's what it's going to take to keep competitive. Um, and as long as we can sustain our ability to grow our food, produce energy, those opportunities will um, open and those barriers will be broke down. So, thank you. Good afternoon, all. All right, I got to get one thing off my plate here. Um, I missed the talk on GMO, but every time I come to one of these uh, events, it seems to bubble up. So I'm going to give you some information from a focus panel of one. Um, I'm Richard McKellogg. I'm the produce director at Lowe's Food Stores. We have 100 stores. We're a family-owned business. Uh, we've operated in North Carolina for 75 years. And um, we have over 100 stores across the state from the mountains to the coast. As the produce and floral director, um, and with over 700,000 customer transactions per week, I get about one inquiry per quarter on whether or not we sell GMO food in our produce department. So if that helps. Um, I thought uh, Senator Jackson kind of nailed it on, on, a, on a number of points. Um, I've never read In Balance with Nature. I wrote it down. Um, how many of you have read The Omnivore's Dilemma? Yeah, my daughter made me read that. So I want to talk a little bit about today about uh, retailers' perspective uh, when it comes to basically uh, the challenges of of food uh, in the 21st century. And once again, the idea that uh, there are nine, going to be nine billion people that, that need to be fed, but then boil it back down to just our local area and what we can do and what we do today. Um, as you know, uh, everything in the, in, in the world seems to go by way of trends. And although the concept of local food is not new, it gained a serious momentum uh, in 2008, around the time of the recession. And I think people were looking for just a simpler life and the whole idea of sustainability, which is not a new idea, um, along with uh, promoting local, became very trendy and a lot of buzzwords around that. Um, like I said before, uh, Lowe's Foods has been around for 74 years. We've all, always promoted uh, local. Uh, it just makes sense economically. Uh, we're no different than the previous two speakers you heard that we also need to make a profit. That is the true sense of uh, sustainability that uh, if, if you're going to continue to roll, uh, you, have, you have to make a profit. What we've done at Lowe's Foods, and um, it hasn't been uh, in a vacuum or by ourselves, is we reached out to um, both of our land-grant universities and the NCDA um, roughly six years ago and said, you know, um, we got a problem here. Um, everybody, uh, including yourselves, you probably know, operate the same way, is that we all go to our offices and we all do what we do and we all do what we've always done and we operate in these silos. And the biggest gap that we saw um, in our company was that we wanted to grow locally with local partners, but we realized, and I even realized that my buyers were sitting at a desk and making phone calls or sending a fax or sending an email and actually cutting purchase orders and buying product off of farms and from people, not only not in North Carolina, but from people they've never met, never seen, never been on the farm. And that is a business model that works, but it really doesn't answer the need. Certainly when you're buying for 100 stores, and just to put that in perspective, I mean, we're no Walmart, we're no Food Line, 
but 100 stores is still pretty big. Um, and our wholesaler sister company also services 500 other independent grocers in eight states. But just even a company our size, we buy and sell over 30 tractor trailer loads of produce every night. So it's a big number. And it's much easier if a buyer is sitting at a desk to cut one, two, or three purchase orders to get product rolling into that warehouse, which turns that very night and rolls back out the next morning. So when we started looking at local and said, how do we increase our local consumption within our own area, we realized it was going to have to be a lot different looking business model than just going through a mass distribution channel. And you've heard the statistics. Um, pretty impressive that Senator Jackson, first generation farmer. Uh, we know the average age of a farmer in North Carolina today is roughly 58 years old. It's usually family land. It's usually land that grew tobacco. And we know a lot of those farmers now are transitioning to next generations, and they want to know how to grow row crops, cash crops. But they have to have the know-how, and they have to be able to learn how to get there. And there's a lot of complexities besides the silos I've just described. Um, food safety. 20 years ago, someone could pull up in a pickup truck to the dock at one of our stores, and they could say, hey, I got some sweet corn here I'd like to sell you. And that produce manager had the autonomy and might look at the corn and say, yeah, that looks good. And oh, by the way, that's cheaper than what I can buy it from my warehouse for. Bring it on in. We can't do that today, not in a world of food safety. Now we have cool responsibility. We have gap responsibilities. We have traceability. Uh, we have FSMA coming down the pike. Food safety is a huge piece of what we do today. So that adds another level of complexity to buying local. But I'm here to tell you that we've um, put some resources against that. And with the help of uh, the North Carolina Department of Agriculture, and especially uh, the Center for Environmental and Farming System and CEFs, and our two land-grant universities, a and and NC State, um, we've been able to partner them under a USDA grant called an AFRI grant. And we're a retail partner. Fort Bragg is involved in Foster Cavanis, a food service company. And Greensboro is also a partner. And this has been a wonderful opportunity for all of us to get together, sit on joint committees, and figure out this entire local food system and bubble up all the complexities and all the issues that come up and how we can grow local food consumption just even within our state. And you heard the number, it's a $70 billion industry agribusiness in North Carolina. 32 million acres of land, still today over 8 million acres of land in our state is dedicated to agribusiness. So a huge, huge opportunity. Um, we've worked really, really hard with SEFs and with small and medium-sized farms who have developed, uh, in some areas, we have uh, aggregation centers where small and medium-sized farmers can bring their product to that aggregation center. The product can be inspected. It can be graded. It can be shipped under one label with traceability standards and get that into mass distribution channel. It's not easy. It's a lot more work. Um, in 2013, uh, through our peak growing uh, season from May through September, um, our North Carolina produce purchases were 25% of our total purchases. It may not seem like that's a lot, but when you think about produce in general, uh, this, is, this is global. I mean, this is a global business, and that's why you're going to see through the Food Safety Modernization Act sweeping changes as to how food and produce in particular comes to our country. So 25% of our produce purchases uh, last growing season were, was just North Carolina alone. If you expand that to include South Carolina and Virginia, 40% of our produce purchases were from that region, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia. So we've made a concerted effort to grow that. Um, we've quadrupled that over the last three years. And so it's just a huge, huge number, and there's huge opportunities. Um, but as I mentioned, the logistics, the food safety issues, when you're dealing with small and local farmers, 
Farmers that traditionally have farmed all week and then taken their product to a farmer's market on a weekend, and now all of a sudden they come to you and say, well, I'd like to sell in your stores. Well, do you have a food safety plan? Do you test your water? How's it packaged? Do you have a UPC, a PLU? I mean, there's just a lot of different things that small and medium-sized farms, uh, and you heard it mentioned earlier also, in and around infrastructure. And when you're a small and medium-sized farmer, infrastructure um, is a cost that is just too overwhelming to get to, so a lot of them just continue to do what they've always done. But through the work we've been able to do with CEFs and NCDA um, and all of our partners, um, we've reached out and we've had uh, seminars with over 250 farmers in the last three years, retail-ready seminars, teaching them how to get to the next level. Um, I love farmers. It's, um, I would never want to be one. It's a really, really difficult life. I'd much rather be on my end. I think uh, to wrap up, I'd just like to say that um, what we've done at Lowe's Foods has not been easy. I have the commitment from our senior management that this is the direction we need to be and go in. Um, I wish they made the same commitment on giving more help to do it. Um, but I, I'm, I'm very, very committed to this. Um, I appreciate the fact that I had an opportunity to come here and talk about this today. And um, I honestly think that this is the future, that there will always be large commercial farming operations going on. But I honestly believe um, that North Carolina has set uh, just a fantastic example for the rest of the country and shown that um, there is still a place for small and medium-sized farms. Uh, it's a great livelihood. It's a worthwhile endeavor. But even the small farms, they have to make a profit too. And I have a saying with all my buyers and all the folks that work under me that it's not a good deal if it's not, if it's not a good deal for both parties. And so we live that every day. Um, once again, I, I want to thank NC State and the relationship we have with them and everything that they've done to help us better understand. After 30 years in this industry, I can honestly tell you that um, I was probably in the dark until the last five or six on really in seeing the big picture. So once again, um, I just encourage you to um, be open-minded. And uh, I, I think it was Henry Ford who said, um, whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're probably right. So uh, with that, thanks very much and have a great afternoon. Well, thank you very much. I've been here since uh, 9 o'clock yesterday morning, uh, and uh, I've listened to all the speeches, all the barriers, uh, talked about this industry. You know, our luncheon speaker today talked about advocacy. And one of the things we do at North Carolina Farm Bureau is the largest farm organization in the state. You know, it's, we, people keep talking about corporate farms or uh, factory farms or big ag. One of the things we've done, you see the, the billboard, We've got four billboards. We're running an experiment around that. Uh, we're in the research, too. Sometimes our research is on public policy and public relations, but we've got four billboards around uh, the city of Raleigh here that says, fact, the truth about ag. 98% of all farms are family farms, and that's true. Beth Foster and her family, uh, Beth was up here. I know the farming operation well down in eastern North Carolina, the Blacklands. They farm over 15,000 acres of land down there. Is that a factory farm? That's a family farm, ladies and gentlemen. That's a family farm. It's a large family farm, but it is a family farm. Here at, uh, we're, we're proud to have been part, uh, I'm proud to have been part of this uh, biotech summit. But ladies and gentlemen, if you don't remember anything else, that I say here, uh, as I look out across, except for Alan Balkum and a few other folks that I know that are, that are farmers, just remember this. this uh, our farmers across this state and nation are well past the debate, any debate, on support for biotechnology or about the many, many ways that this 
benefits agriculture and our society. Ladies and gentlemen, for farmers, our farmers across the state of North Carolina, across the country, this train has left the station. It left the station years ago. You heard Brent Jackson talk about it. What our farmers need are those of you that are out there. I see there are many students, grad students, researchers. You're an important part that back up that back up this industry of agriculture, that back up these farmers that are out there across North Carolina and across this country today. You know, we're talking about biotechnology, and the reason there are not that many farmers in here today are that they're, they're worried about right now, uh, they're worried about the impact of the Food Safety Modernization Act, as Richard Kellogg, he's too worried about it from, from, uh, from a Lowe's food standpoint, our farmers are worried about it from their processing abilities or their production abilities. They're worried today about the impact of the new farm bill, how they'll deal with that. Uh, our, our pork farmers, the cure for this pig virus, PED, and, and what are we going to do? How are we going to get that back into production? The sweet potato necrosis, you heard somebody talk about it yesterday. That's a huge issue out there. We're the number one sweet potato producing state in the nation. Farm labor, I didn't want to have to talk to you about farm labor and immigration, how important it is in a diversified agriculture state like we are. You know, the farm gate value in North Carolina is about $12 billion. Four crops take up four of those $12 billion. That's uh, fruits and vegetables, tobacco, Christmas trees, and ag nursery and greenhouse operations. That's a, the horticulture industry. Four per, those four crops, what do they all have in common? Labor and lots of This immigration issue is huge for our farmers here. Water use, land use, and annexation in our, in our uh, towns that are our farmers that are in close proximity to these, uh, to these, farm, to these uh, cities, municipalities marketing decisions that our farmers are making, planning decisions, and certainly a big one always is financing these operations. So, you know, what, what, you, what we're talking about here on, in biotech and the research and a lot of things that we've talked about for two days, for our farmers today, that's more what, what we're talking about is more of a backroom operation. They need it. They want it. They're, gonna, they're demanding it. If, if it's, if, if it's the traits are there, they pass all the security, the FDA, all those, and they get to market. And it's been said, I don't know if some of the folks in the industry can say that it takes about $150 million to get one trait to market. So after it goes through all those hoops and it gets to the farmer uh, standpoint, the farmer is out of across the state, they're ready to go with it. What we're, uh, what, what we're at, right at the, we've embraced the technology, and we're currently at the stage, our farmers are currently at the stage of requesting, requesting additional research to help move not just the biotech industry, but to help advance the total agricultural industry and increase our ability as producers to efficiently and, as Beth said, to profitably feed the world now and in the future. And these, these, this extensive research, ladies and gentlemen, will request resources, both financial and human resources. And so uh, North Carolina, as I said, with our, diversified, with our diversified ag industry in this state, coupled with our top research universities that we have in this state, at NC State, NC A&T, including uh, our other part uh, public universities, what we're doing at the research campus in Kannapolis, as well as what's going on at our private universities, and has been said here many times, coupled with the um, international agricultural giants that are located in RTP. All of this, ladies and gentlemen, makes North Carolina the premier place to bring all these ingredients together to make this the number one state for agriculture, for agricultural research, we, uh, I think, I believe in my, uh, in my years here, there's never been a brighter time for the industry of agriculture, and certainly there's never been a brighter place for this industry to expand and grow than right here in our state. What are some of the barriers that we, that we deal with here locally? Uh, we all know that there's been a growing disconnect between, uh, 
of the agricultural and the non-agricultural populations. Uh, that's, no, that's no 15 counties in this state elect 50% of the General Assembly. That's why we as a farm organization, Senator Jackson and others, we have one heck of a job now down at the General Assembly. We spend a tremendous amount of our time down trying to educate our urban legislators about the value of the industry. Many people don't even, agri don't even know that agriculture is number one. Who would tell me, some of you probably don't even know what the number two industry in the state of North Carolina is. What's, who can tell me what the number two industry? Tourism, Tourism is distant third. Most sometimes it gets up there. The military. The military, we're, we're, and so, you know, I always like to tell folks, you know, the, our, the, the first line of defense in our national security is our men and women uh, in, in the military that are in, the, in arms. The second important critical part of our national security, as best said, I think, is our food security. And certainly that's where we, so, so teaming up with the military, and we do it quite often on many, many issues dealing with uh, food production, uh, militaries can't, uh, the military bases we have here, the uh, encroachment issue is a huge issue as, as we uh, work to the, work with them. Um, as I said, here in North Carolina, generally uh, we have a favorable environment on biotechnology, but we'll certainly we all understand the impact of a changing population and the changing population, uh, a growing population here in North Carolina. We're increasing population here by 100,000 people a year. That makes, that makes uh, today, while we're sitting here, 274 more people have come into North Carolina. Is that a challenge for agriculture and our ability to, to farm? You, you bet it is. Um, certainly from a national, as been said, was said yesterday, one of some of the uh, challenges we have uh, dealing with this industry uh, is as we try to bring new technologies to market is uh, the approval, the delays in the product approval uh, by our regulatory agencies uh, such as USDA and, and EPA. One of the other challenges we have are, are regulatory challenges and uh, our farmers, not only our, our industry folks, but our farmers also have those challenges and, and with regulations. You know, regulations uh, th those are, there are costs associated with regulations that farmers can't pass on. And so we have to, we have to contend with those regulations. And, and what people, some people don't understand, if you want to talk about the more regulations you pile on an agricultural operation, you drive it to big. You drive it to large. Because to comply with those regulations, you have to have people, whether it be GAP, whether it be food, uh, you're just driving that, you, it, you cause small to go out, small food processors, you drive it, you drive it to big. So watching how you uh, uh, put regulations on an industry, particularly like agriculture, that can't pass those costs along is certainly uh, a, a, an issue. Internationally, we all know, it's been said, you know, a lot of people have stood here in the last two days, uh, some I agreed with, some I didn't agree with, and and talked about uh, some of the challenges we have internationally in terms of food production. We all know that there are cultural differences uh, in societies. There are political issues out there that impact food production. Oftentimes, there are barriers that, that are put up that are disguised as non-tariff trade barriers. A few years ago, to, to point this out, a few years ago, I was in South Africa, on the northern part of South Africa, uh, on the border of Zimbabwe. And in that particular area I was in, they had the highest incidence of esophageal cancer of anywhere in the world. Why did they have the highest incidence of esophageal cancer? The natives there, the main diet was corn, they called it mealy meal, cornmeal, they ground it up. And there was no pesticides, there were no, um, no, no, nothing to stop the corn earworm. And so corn earworm was rampant every time the corn would put an ear there with corn earworm. And those of you that see, know what the corn earworm is in the corn, there's excrement there. And when that corn dries, a lot of that becomes aflatoxins, vomitoxins, uh, mycotoxins. And I'm certainly talking over my academic head here, Dean. But, but with those, but they consumed, when they ground that corn up with all those toxins in it, uh, and consumed it on a daily basis in the quantities they did. They had the highest level of esophageal cancer anywhere in the world. Now, what could have prevented that? Biotech corn. 
biotech corn. One, with that trait, the one trait in biotech corn did absolutely nothing. It could have prevented death and, and esophageal cancer. Why weren't they allowed to use it? The European Union, in trade issues, the European Union put a heavy hand down and said, we, we're, if, we tr if you use this, we're not going to trade with you. And so they didn't. So they're, what kind of an issue was that? Was that an ag issue? Was it a political issue? Was it an economic issue? Was it a cultural issue? There are a lot of different, there are a lot of different uh, uh, things that, that go into these issues. They're not just uh, as, as, as uh, easy as they might seem. Well, I, uh, you know, I just think that uh, we, our consumers have a right to know uh, where their food comes from. We believe they need to know how it's produced and the technologies that are used to produce it. We have no problem with that. And certainly, we work with coalitions all the time. Uh, agriculture, I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, is not afraid to engage in these discussions, but we must guard against. I believe that we must guard against the adoption of public policy that is not based on sound, rational, scientific research and data. Because to do that will be like a ship moving with no rudder. It will take, I believe, a unified effort on the part of the research community, uh, public and private universities, government agencies, as well as our farmers to tell this story. I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Please let's again thank our panel, Larry, Richard, Beth, and the Senator.